because I want to give you an overview of the Nile Valley because we're going to spend quality time there. And before we do the Nile Valley, um, we're going to look at ancient West Asia. Then we're going to go upstairs. I want to show you a piece by Elizabeth Catlett, the African-American sculpturist who just passed away in 2012. She lived in Mexico, who was almost 100 years old. And she's done great work. And then I want to show you a couple pieces from the uh, 18th, three pieces from the 18th and 19th centuries. One from by an artist from France, whose work I admire. Two by an American artist. And then I want to finish by looking at the African presence in the uh, European Renaissance. And on the way, even, they don't, even though they don't have any artifacts that reflect it, I want to spend some time talking about the African presence in the Greco-Roman world. But it's appropriate to start here, even though this isn't an African-looking piece. It represents a civilization in which there is a strong African element. And if I seem tired, it's been a long trip, and I didn't sleep well last night. Just had a bad drink, woke up in the middle of the night, never did get settled. But anyway, this jade piece right here is from the civilization called the Olmec, O-L-M-E-C. And the Olmec civilization is important to us because it's the first monumental civilization of the Western Hemisphere. Um, I led three tour groups this summer. I took, I took a group to Namibia, I took a group to Cuba, and I just recently took a group to Mexico, and this was the focus. Mostly what stands out about the Olmec civilization, and I'm sure you've seen it at some point in time, are these massive stone heads, of which there are 20, and all of which, no two look the same, and they all have African characteristics. So the Olmec civilization, more than anything else, especially those heads, tells us of an African presence in America 1,500 years before, 3,500 years before enslavement, and the same length of time before the arrival of Columbus. Now this year, uh, I didn't realize until we got there that this is the 40th anniversary of the publication of Ivan Van Sertima's book, The African Presence in Ancient America that came before Columbus. And I didn't realize until I reviewed it just about a week or two ago for a book that I'm working on, how important that book actually is. In the 1950s, we had a champion named Sheikh Anta Joe. I say the 1950s because his first publication was done in 1948, and then his major works were done in the 1950s, and they were amplified in the 60s and early 70s. And he, more than anybody else, showed beyond a shadow of doubt that the uh, that Nile Valley civilization was an African civilization. Now we should. I mean to uh, Mexico about four years ago and I was talking to a guy who I liked, a tour leader, um, a tour guide, who was white, Mexican, Blanco. And I liked him, we got along pretty well. He did what I told him to do for the most part, which is a prerequisite if I'm running the <laughs> do what I tell you to do. And don't argue with me irrespective of what your opinion is, but I like this guy. And so I asked him, I said, Andres, 
uh, what would you, how would you feel if I suggested the possibility that maybe the Olmec heads had African features? I'm being as delicate and diplomatic as I can. He says, I don't believe it. And I said, well, why do you think the heads look African? He says, it's just a style of art. So I dismissed him after that, because you don't just imagine an African face. It's not just something you just conjure up. Here, the heads are missing, and these heads are undoubtedly in a museum or private collection somewhere. But it's still worth having in the museum. You see them holding in their hands a kind of a, a cylindrical object. And we really don't know what they were. It's been suggested that those were power sticks. But this is one of the mysteries that I have. I don't really know what they were. These may have been scribes, writers. And the reason I say that is because this one in particular, you can see something sticking out of his waist. That was probably a writing instrument, a writing implement, this I-S sound. Ramesses, Amenophis, Tutmosis, Isis, Osiris, that's Greek. And sometimes we use those names just because the Greeks spent so much time in Africa. So much of the Greek writings, so many of the Greek writings have survived, and we're familiar with those words. But we're trying to move and use more African terms. So, Heru is also identified with the noonday sun. And these figures are identified as the sons of Heru. And they represent different animals. This is a baboon, this is a jackal, one is a human being, and the other is a hawk. So all of these figures had symbolism. The baboon was considered a very intelligent animal. Okay? So he's identified with the intellect. The jackal is important in the ritual of death because the jackal is associated with death. Okay? And in fact, a figure you could say the god of death, if you want to use that term, Anubis has the head of a jackal. And then the hawk was also the symbol of Heru, who was also identified with the noonday sun. And the sun would cross the horizon, and Heru was identified with that. Also, one other thing I wanted to point out. Nigeria, and it was the scene of a kingdom called the Kingdom of Edo, E-D-O, and you have these magnificent bronzes which have really been pillaged. The best ones are in the British Museum in London. The British led a punitive expedition to Edo in 1897 and took a lot of these pieces back, and the Nigerians have been squawking for years now about getting those pieces back, and the British are saying, no way, Jose. We stole it fair and because, square. Yeah, they stole it fair and square. Because the British basically say now it's the world heritage. It belongs to the world. And that we are better prepared to take care of it than you are. And that if we give you this back, then everybody's going to want this stuff back. Which means the museum is going to be diminished. Let's go around here. 